All right, we're going to look at a couple of different types of fundamental theorem problems here. Uh, this is more like what you will see on the AP exam. Where the heck is my cursor? There it is. Okay. Uh, okay, first problem right here. Classic calculus question. You're given a function. You're asked to find the equation of a line tangent. Um, now, anytime you're asked to find the equation of a line tangent, this question we have seen quite a bit. Anytime you are finding the equation of a line tangent, you will always need a point and you will need a slope every single time. Uh, now, as year has progressed, we have learned different ways to get slopes. It's not as simple as it was back in at the beginning of the school year. Um, so let's look at this one. Here we have an actual integral defined function. To find a point, if you have a function and I want that point, that function's value at 1, I will need to find f of 1. So I have to plug in 1 for my function f, but you have to remember that f is a function of x. So if I want f of 1, I'm going to plug in 1 for the x in the integral. So f of 1 would be the antiderivative from 1 to 1 under the function square root t cubed. T nah, cubed, that wasn't a 3. There we go. t cubed plus 1 dt. And the area from 1 to 1 doesn't matter what the function is. You do not have to integrate this. The area from 1 to 1, you're not going anywhere. That area is 0. So since f of 1 is 0, I now know that my point is the ordered pair 1, 0. Um, and that's half of it. So I've got my point now to get the slope. Um, well defined slope in calculus, we always need f prime of x. So first I'm going to find f prime of x. And this is where the fundamental theorem comes into play. To do the derivative of an integral defined function like this, um, you know that the derivative, I don't know what I'm doing up here, uh, you know that the derivative, what we'll do is we'll just plug in the x for the t's, so f prime of x is going to equal the square root of, instead of t cubed, it's going to become x cubed plus 1, and then always remember that you do multiply by the derivative of what you plugged in. I plugged in an x, the derivative of x is 1. In this case, that's not going to change the problem any, so I'm not going to worry about it. So I have my derivative, but I need the actual slope, not just the derivative. So at 1, my slope is going to be the square root of 1 cubed plus 1, which is the square root of 2. There's my slope. Slope. There we go. All right, so there's my slope. Uh, and then once you have your point and slope, you channel your, you just throw it into the point slope form. Y minus Y coordinate equals slope X minus X coordinate. And you're done. There you go. Uh, getting your equation of a tangent line is the exact same process. You've got to get that point. You've got to get the slope. You're usually going to use derivatives to get slopes. Uh, and that's what we did here. It's just the derivative technique is a little bit different than what we're used to doing. But it all boils down to getting the point and the slope. Uh, next question. Uh, this will be the last one, but it has four parts. Um, you have g of x is this integral. And I give you the graph of f down here. And I tell you that the graph of f does consist of line segments and a semicircle that's going to come into play in the very first part. Okay, so the first part says evaluate g at different places, at different x coordinates. So let's start with g of negative 1. Well, if you remember back to algebra 1, if you want to know g of something, in this case it's g of x, I want to plug in negative 1 for the x's. That means g of negative 1 is going to be the antiderivative from 0 to negative 1 of the function f of t dt. Uh, well, g of negative 1 is not as simple in this problem as f of 1 was in problem number 1. In f of 1, we weren't going anywhere, so the area was 0. This one, we actually are traveling somewhere. We're starting at 0, and we're traveling to the left to negative 1. Uh, well, what you have to remember is, a definite, is that a definite integral does refer to area under a curve. So to evaluate these place, the, evaluate g at these x-coordinates, I'm simply going to look at my graph and I'm going to say, well, if I go from 0 to negative 1, we're finding the area under the curve right here. And this is nice because everything is straight. We have straight sides all over the place. And what I see here, I have an area of 1 for that one box, and then I have a triangle with a base of 1 and a height of 1. Um, half 
base times height is going to be 1 half. So g of negative 1, that gives you an area right here of 1.5 or 3 halves. But then you have to remember, if you travel from right to left, that is a negative direction. So this actually is going to be a negative area because we are traveling right to left. So negative because... Uh, that's supposed to be an A. That's an A. It's crap A, but whatever. Because we're going right. Why can't I spell? What's going on? To left. My handwriting is crap today, too. Whatever. All right, so G of negative 1, we simply plug in negative 1 to the integral, and we find that area. And that's what we're doing for part A. Uh, the next one, G of 0. Now, this one's going to be nice, because G of 0, if I plug in 0 for my x's, that will be the area from 0 to 0 under F. And this one, we don't even have to look at the graph. If you're not going anywhere, we're going from 0 to 0. That area is 0. So there's G of 0. G of 2 is going to be a little bit more difficult. That's going to be the area from 0 to 2 under my graph of F. And the area from 0 to 2, let's see, now I'm going from here all the way to 2 right here. So we need to get all of this area. Um, I see the two boxes right here. That's going to be an area of 2. Plus, and then I have a half a box here. So there's an area of 1 half. Plus, and then for the last one, I've got a triangle with a height of 3 and a base of 2. So I'm going to do my area. I'm sorry, base of 1. It's 1 half. The base of that triangle is 1. The height of that triangle is 3. Uh, and for the sake of simplifying, that would be 2 plus 1 half plus 3 halves is going to clean up to an overall area of 4. And so there are your three answers to part A. You simply plug in the values for the x, just like you would in algebra 1. You're substituting negative 1, 0, and 2 for x. Then we have to compute the area under the curve. Number B, identify all the critical numbers of G. Okay, stop right there for a sec. How do you find critical numbers of a function? Well, to find critical numbers, you need to find the derivative of that function. Whoops, the derivative, and you set it equal to 0. So if I'm going to find the critical numbers of G, I need to find G prime of X. Well, this isn't going to be too bad because G is one of those integral defined functions. And to do G prime of X... The derivative of, an, of the integral, we simply take that x and we plug it in for the t. So g prime of x is actually going to equal f of x. I'm going to plug in the x for the t. So g prime is f of x. Remember, you always multiply by the derivative of what you plug in. I plugged in an x. The derivative of x is 1. It's not going to change the problem much. So I'll set that equal to 0. And we need to know when the graph of f of x equals 0. Well, we're looking at the graph of f. So if I want to know when this graph equals 0, those are your x-intercepts. So x-intercepts right here. I hit the x-axis right there, and I hit the x-axis right there. So critical numbers are x equals negative 1, 2, 3.5, negative 2, and positive 2. So those are your critical numbers. You're looking at the derivative, and it may not be a bad idea once you make the connection that f is the derivative of g, then maybe... I'll just make a note to myself that I am also looking at the derivative of g prime. Uh, let's see, number c here. At what x-coordinate does g attain a local max? Now we're getting a little bit more difficult. Um, remember, local max would occur at a critical number. We already know that the critical numbers of g, and this is what we did in part b, they are x equals negative 3.5 negative 2, and 2. So those are our candidates. If G has a local max, it's going to be at one of those three places. Remember, we are looking at the derivative of G. This is a graph of G prime. And so think about a local max. If a graph has a local max, the derivative, your slopes, will change from positive. You have positive slopes, and then we need to change to a negative slope. So since I'm looking at G prime right here, a max occurs when the derivative changes from uh, a positive slope 
to negative. Uh, and that's what I'm going to look for here. I'm looking at I'm looking at the derivative. I need the derivative to change from positive to negative. I think I used the word slope in there inappropriately. So we need the derivative to change from positive to negative. All right, at negative 3.5, look at this x coordinate. At negative 3.5, this is the derivative. My derivative is below the x-axis, then it changes to above the x-axis. My derivative is negative, then it is positive. Negative to positive, that's a local minimum. That's not what we're looking for. That's a local minimum because the derivative is negative, then it's positive. At my next critical number, negative 2, my derivative is positive on the left side, then it is positive on the right side. Maybe I'll highlight this as I'm talking. So we were have a negative derivative, then change to a positive derivative. Positive, actually we're positive, all, well, geez, that was stupid. We're positive all the way through here positive, positive. Then we are positive again, positive derivative. Then at this x coordinate, and this is going to be our answer, at x equals 2, my derivative changed from positive, and then my derivative changed back to negative. So negative derivative, negative derivative. There's my local max. So x equals 2 is the local max. I did not ask for justification, but our justification would be the derivative change from positive to negative. I've already written it up here. But x equals 2 is the local max. There is a local minimum at x equals negative 3.5. Negative 2 is nothing. It's just a, a critical number. All right, last problem. Last problem. Um, where, does, where is the graph of g concave up? Okay, let's think of concavity. When is a function concave up? A function is concave up whenever the second derivative is greater than 0. So we're looking for when the second derivative is positive. Let's see, we're on the interval negative 5 to 5. Um, we are looking at the graph of g prime. We're looking at the graph of g prime. So if I want my second derivative to be positive, we have to think, about what that means in relation to my first derivative. Um, well, the second derivative, and this is kind of my thought process, I'm going to do my little thought bubble up here. The second derivative is the slope of the first derivative. Um, so if you do the slope of this first derivative, that will give you the second derivative. So I need my second derivative to be positive. That means I need the slope of g prime to be greater than 0. And since I'm looking at g prime, I want to know where this thing has positive slopes. Well, we have positive slopes any time that this graph, the derivative, is increasing. My function g prime, my graph of g prime, we're increasing right here. And then we're increasing right here. We have a positive slope here. And we have a positive slope here. All of the other parts have a negative slope. We're decreasing here. We're decreasing between 1 and 3. So if I want the graph of g to be concave up, second derivative is positive. Slopes of the first derivative are positive. That occurs on the intervals negative 5 to negative 3. Again, from negative 2 all the way up to 1. And you might, there is that weird corner right here. I think I may, uh, I'll leave it negative 2 to 1. You could, for negative 2 to 1, you could actually split it at negative 1 because there is that weird non-differentiable point. Um, anyway, so continuing. So we have positive slopes there. We also have positive slopes after 3 and up until 5. So from 3 to 5. There is where the graph is concave up. If you were asking for justification, I didn't ask it here, but if it asks you to justify, this is your justification right here. G double prime is positive or the slope of G prime is positive. Those are saying the same thing. So there we go. Those are a few uses of the fundamental theorem of calculus, how you will likely see them on the AP exam or on a test or any other formal type of assessment. And we will go over this in a little bit more detail later.